morning and welcome to today's wellness webinar from Friends Life Care on How to Heal the Gut, Secrets of Your Microbiome. My name is Gail Tamaraccio and I'm the Friends Life Care Director of Wellness Initiatives and your moderator for today's session. Um, before we get started, I want to provide some housekeeping information um, to ensure that you know how to participate in today's event. So um, here is a screenshot and this is what you should see on your screen right now. This is your attendee interface. Now you are listening in on your computer or tablet speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone and the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. There is an orange arrow next to this area of the interface. It's at the very top left of the dialog box. Now you'll have the opportunity to submit questions and comments during the presentation by typing into the questions pane of the attendee interface. And we encourage you to ask questions at any time. And so you can send your questions in and just know that Lauren will be able to respond to some questions during the presentation and she'll also answer questions at the end of the webinar. So just be patient if your question isn't answered uh, right when you ask it. Um, we just ask that your question be of a general nature that will benefit the entire audience and not uh, anything that's specific or requesting any particular medical advice. Um, there may be a few times during the webinar where Lauren will ask you to participate by raising your hand. You can do so by clicking on the hand icon on your screen. You will find it by looking at the bottom of the column with the orange arrow and directly next to the question box. The question box is the one that has the big brown arrow pointing toward it. Now there are two handouts that are available for download on the handout section of the interface. One will give you a summary of today's talk and the other one has probiotic food recipes. You will not need them during the presentation and you can download them at any time that you like. Now I'd now like to introduce our presenter, Certified Registered Nurse Practitioner Lauren Hauser. Lauren is a fellowship trained integrative nurse practitioner at Philadelphia Integrative Medicine with Dr. Georgia Tetlow. She received her master's degree in nursing from Thomas Jefferson University and her fellowship training from the University of Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine. And Lauren is passionate about applying cutting edge integrative medicine in the clinic as well as leading monthly classes to educate and empower the community about healthy lifestyle choices. She brings hope as well as a practical, holistic approach to her work with patients. Her specialties are women's health, fertility, digestive concerns, and thyroid issues. And so without any further ado, I present Lauren. And Lauren, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks, Gail. It's a pleasure to be here with the members of Friends Life Care. Um, and thank you for your kind introduction. Um, so as Gail said, my name is Lauren Hauser. I'm a nurse practitioner at Philadelphia Integrative Medicine with Dr. Georgia Tetlow in Wayne. Um, I just want to share a little bit about what integrative medicine is before we jump into the Heal Your Gut topic. Um, integrative medicine combines the best of conventional medicine and alternative medicine to inspire you and give you the tools to care for yourself and to be well. We are patient focused and we are lifestyle focused so we hope to inspire you to make changes in your lifestyle in terms of diet, exercise, mind-body practices, um, making sure you have the nutrients you need to, to optimize your wellness and to fight chronic disease. So without further ado, let's jump into how to heal your gut, secrets of your microbiome. This is a really exciting topic. It's one of my favorites to talk about um, because it's really applicable to everybody. Um, and for two main reasons. One, the health of our gut impacts our overall wellness and almost every organ system. And the second being, it's rooted in lifestyle interventions. It can be manipulated and changed by the things we put into our bodies. Um, how well we exercise um, can all impact our microbiome. So I'd just like to get a feel for kind of what motivated um, members to enroll in this webinar. Uh, if you could just raise your hand if you're here because you're interested in learning about prevention of chronic illness and prevention of inflammation. Okay, great. Um, and then is anyone here because they have a specific gastrointestinal complaint, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, bloating, um, if you could raise your hand as well. Okay, great. So it looks like we're kind of 50-50 divided there. So let's review kind of the topics we're going to cover today. Um, we're going to start by just uh, addressing what is the microbiome. And then we're going to talk about why it's important for our health and overall wellness. Then we're going to dive into how it can be disrupted, how this normal flora or bacteria in our gut um, can get imbalanced. 
then we're going to talk about ways that happens, and then how we can test for it from an integrative or functional medicine perspective, and then most importantly, some steps and real concrete tools and applications to help optimize your, your gut health and to restore its wellness. And that's a four-step four approach. It's called remove, replace, re-inoculate, or repair, or the 4R approach. So what is the microbiome? So we have trillions of microbes that live in and on us in a symbiotic relationship. We used to think they were all bad. Uh, now we're learning that we receive as much benefit from them as they do from us. Um, they get shelter and food and warmth from living on and in us, but we're also receiving immense benefit. And when I say microbes, I'm not just talking about bacteria. I'm referring to viruses, parasites, yeasts. They all make up these tiny, tiny microorganisms that inhabit our, our skin and our gut and our nose and our mouth and our, our vagina. They all are colonized with trillions and trillions of microbes. The largest concentration is in our large intestines and colon. And that's what we're really going to focus on today. Um, things to know and interesting kind of tidbits about our microbiome, which pretty much just means all the microbes that, that live in and on us. We carry around about six pounds, six pounds of bacteria and viruses. That's 10 to 100 trillion. We have more DNA from bacteria and viruses than we do our own. And that each microbiome is unique to the individual. And this is due to environmental factors like diet and lifestyle, but also to genetics. So certain genes or genetic variants can impact the gut flora as well. So we know this has happened. We know we carry around an immense amount of bacteria, but why is it important? How does it affect our overall wellness? So when I say gut, I'm referring to um, the GI tract which runs from our mouth to our rectum. But most specifically, I'm talking about our large and our small intestine. So key fundamental things that happen in these areas of our body. Um, one, it's where we regulate absorption of nutrients. It helps us process toxins and allergens correctly. Um, the second piece is it's where our second brain is. We make more neurotransmitters, things like serotonin, norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine. These are our feel-good neurotransmitters that regulate our mood. We make more here in our gut than we do in our brains. Not only are neurotransmitters made in our gut, but our gut is also filled with nerves. Our gut lining makes up our enteric nervous system, or ENS. This is a two thin layers of more than 100 million cells that line our GI tract from our esophagus down to our rectum. And this is a bi-directional communication system. So I think we've all experienced this connection before. We're feeling anxious, or we get butterflies in our stomach, or we have to run to the bathroom. Um, there's also a link between conditions like irritable bowel syndrome and anxiety and depression. This is just one example of the kind of the gut-brain connection link that we're seeing. And there's a growing body of research more and more every day uh, that suggests supporting the good bacteria in our gut has very real effects on our mood. And I see this often in the clinic as well. One of the ways we address anxiety and depression is really evaluating the gut health. Another key role for our our healthy gut is to it houses our immune system. So believe it or not, 75% of our immune system lives in our gut. Um, so that means this is where inflammation can originate and where it's modulated. So our gut acts as the gatekeeper of inflammation. And now we're learning that inflammation is, is a, a root cause for a lot of chronic disease, from heart disease to diabetes um, to autoimmune disease. So really having, having a healthy gut helps prevent these chronic illnesses and helps decrease inflammation throughout our body. And kind of the last piece is it plays, our gut plays a large role in our metabolism and our weight management. So believe it or not, 20% of our thyroid hormone is converted from an inactive form to active form where that can actually bind to our cell and impact the metabolism. It happens in our gut. So if we have disruption in our, in our gut flora, if we have 
issues going on there, we can have slower metabolism because our thyroid is not functioning optimally. Another piece is the weight management piece. We're starting to learn that certain concentrations or ratios of bacteria in our, in our gut can impact our propensity to be obese or to gain weight. Uh, one of the key things we've seen here is um, with fecal transplant studies. So they're using fecal transplants to treat uh, resistant um, C. difficile, which is a bacteria infection that causes diarrhea if you acquire in the hospital. And there's an example of a woman who had a transfer from her daughter. And the woman was not overweight, but her daughter was. She had a, the transfer of the fecal material from her daughter, and the woman started to gain weight. Didn't change her what she was eating or her movement. It was specifically from the ratio of bacteria from her daughter's um, bowel. So really an interesting example of how our, another piece to the obesity puzzle that the, the ratio of bacteria in our gut can play a role. So as you can see, our healthy gut is not about just absorbing nutrients, but also it's our immune system lives there. It plays a role in our metabolism, our weight management, and it plays a big role in, in our mood. So how can this disruption or how can this normal flora that lives in our gut become disrupted? And I love this quote from Hippocrates, all disease begins in the gut, um, because it's true. Um, so here are three kind of main er reasons or areas that can cause disruption in the gut that we're going to cover today. There are, there are others, but I think these are the primary ones um, and they're most applicable to most people. Um, so we're going to talk about intestinal permeability, which is also um, a layman term is leaky gut. We're going to discuss dysbiosis. So this is this imbalance of ratio of, of good bacteria to bad bacteria. It's an overgrowth of bacteria or yeast or parasites. And then we're going to talk about something called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which is a dysbiosis or overgrowth of bacteria in our small intestines rather than our large intestines. And these three conditions um, and this disruption of our normal flora in our gut has been associated with conditions from cancer to autism. Um, for example, I, I often see disruption in gut flora with autoimmune conditions, things like Hashimoto's, Graves' disease, irritable bowel disease, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, um, lupus. Um, as I mentioned before, with mood disorders, anxiety and depression, there's a link to disruption in the gut flora. Skin conditions. Uh, because it is uh, where our immune system lives, if there's, there's disruption there, oftentimes it will manifest as skin, so acne, rashes, eczema. And then overall inflammation, things like cardiac disease, diabetes, joint pain, um, can all be, be impacted by the health of our gut and the flora in our gut. So the first one is intestinal permeability. So this is this leaky gut. So if you look at this picture here, the red part is our bloodstream. That's our blood capillaries. So that's where our immune cells live. So that's kind of on the inside. Um, the purple here is our gut lining. And this is only one cell layer thick. And it's the same cell, the same type of tissue as our skin, it's epithelium. And these cells are held together by something called tight junctions. So you can see that the purples on the right and the left are kind of very closely together. And this is because this is our, our barrier. So it allows good things in nutrients that we need to absorb, um, signals from our environment, it allows that in. But it also keeps things out. Things aren't ready to be digested, toxins. Um, and what can happen over time is that, and there, we'll go over kind of certain things that can impact this, is that these tight junctions can become loose. And when that happens, larger pieces of undigested food particles and microorganisms and toxins can actually get into the bloodstream. And here in our bloodstream is our, our immune system cells, and they, they tend to get on kind of high alert because they're overstimulated. Um, and that starts this process of inflammation. Um, so when, when these tight junctions get disrupted or this mucosal barrier in our gut lining, gets disrupted, it can stimulate the immune system. Um, any questions about that piece about intestinal permeability or leaky gut? I very often see this with, with food allergies and sensitivities and also with autoimmune 
conditions because when the immune system is in overdrive, um, it can get confused and start to attack its own tissues. And the other piece I wanted to point out is you do not have to have gastrointestinal symptoms to have intestinal impermeability. So oftentimes patients have brain fog or fatigue or joint pain um, and not necessarily have diarrhea, bloating, constipation, um, specific kind of gut complaints. The second disruption that can happen is dysbiosis. And this is when the good bacteria, um, the balance of the good bacteria and the less favorable bacteria or pathogenic bacteria get out of, out of whack. Um, so some good bacteria you'll see kind of on the, the right side of the scale are bifido, lactobacillus, saccharomyces boulardii. And on the left here, you see some things that are present in our gut, um, but often in lower ratios, things like candida, which is yeast, clostridium, um, Klebsiella, uh, viruses, rubella, Epstein-Barr. And what we want is we want a, a good ratio of the commensal bacteria to the pathogenic bacteria. And when this ratio can get disrupted, we often have symptoms of inflammation. Um, and it also can lead to this intestinal permeability, can affect the tight junctions of our cell. I have a question here. Let's see if I can, I can read it here. So what are the symptoms of intestinal permeability and how do you know it is a problem is our first question. Um, so symptoms can vary for the individual. They can range from symptoms of chronic inflammation like headache, joint pain, brain fog. Um, they can be skin conditions. They can be autoimmune disease. And then they could be symptoms of gut dysfunction, things like diarrhea or constipation or bloating or abdominal pain. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about how it's, how do we know it's a problem when we get to the piece on testing. So thank you for your question. So the next, the next piece is about SIBO. So this is this small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So gut dysbiosis and intestinal permeability are related to the large intestines. Our small intestines is where we absorb most of our nutrients. Um, and believe it or not, while we have a ton of good, we want a lot of good bacteria, we want a lot of bacteria in general and microbes in our large intestine, our small intestine actually has very little bacteria. Um, and what can happen, um, and we'll go through kind of causes of this, is that we can get bacterial overgrowth for this dysbiosis in the small intestine. And these are kind of the symptoms that we have that are associated with this SIBO, um, diarrhea or constipation, nausea, bloating, I think is one of the biggest ones I hear, um, vomiting, abdominal pain, uh, weight loss or weight gain, depression, acne and rosacea. There's been some clinical um, studies that show there's a really high correlation of rosacea, which is kind of a flushing in your cheeks, um, to small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, fatigue, joint pain, and malnutrition. So if there's an overgrowth of, of bacteria in our small intestine, where we do most of our absorption of nutrients, then it's going to impact our nutrition and, and if we're getting enough of what we need. Um, particularly B vitamins is something that I see often um, very low in patients with SIBO because they're just not absorbing it with this overgrowth. So to answer, answer the question, we're going to talk about causes. Why this happens? How do we get these imbalances in our gut? And there are several. Um, one of, I think, the primary things we see is, is medications. Um, so certain medications, while needed for, for from life-saving conditions, have been overused um, and have, have real side effects or impacts on our gut. So I think most people are familiar with the impact of antibiotics on our gut. Um, Antibiotics are not specific to whatever infection you're fighting, whether it's you know strep throat or a sinus infection or um, or pneumonia. They also impact the fl good flora in our gut. So by taking frequent antibiotics um, or taking them long term for things like acne, um, can can impact or decrease the good flora in our gut and increase the the potential pathogenic bacteria. Also, proton pump inhibitors or histamine blockers. So these are medications that are prescribed for acid reflux. 
and what they do is they uh, inhibit the acid production in our stomach and the acid, acid is needed to break down food so that we can absorb it but also it acts as a um, barrier to prevent bad bacteria or, com or um, yeast or parasites from getting into our, our intestines and, and when we have that level missing oftentimes can it, it can increase dysbiosis. And these are available over the counter now, um, so we're really seeing this be a, a big issue. It also can impact the absorption of things like magnesium um, and vitamin D, which can affect bone health. So we're seeing that as a correlation with this increased use of uh, PPIs and histamine blockers as well. Um, NSAIDs, so Advil, um, Advil over-the-counter NSAIDs as well as prescription anti-inflammatories and steroids can also affect the bacteria in our gut. Things like hormones, whether birth control or um, bioidentical or hormones later in life can, can affect our, our gut bacteria as well. Um, those are kind of the medication pieces that, that play a role in, in the bacteria in our gut. From a dietary standpoint, diets high in carbohydrates, processed foods, sugar, and low in fiber um, can contribute to poor, um, poor gut health as well, um, particularly fiber. Uh, fiber is actually what good bacteria eat. Um, so if our, our diet is low in fiber, the bacteria is not getting enough food to either stay in your gut or to be healthy and flourish there. And then stress. Um, so stress can play a big role in, in changing our gut flora. Um, when you are stressed, you increase the production of a hormone called cortisol. And when we have high levels of cortisol, our blood flow is directed away from our gut and from digestion and goes to our heart and our brain and our muscles so that we can run fast and fight you know, the perceived stressor. Um, so when we're in a stress state and we have high levels of cortisol, um, we don't get the blood flow to our gut um, to digest our food. Um, environmental toxins exposure also can can disrupt our, our flora and our gut. Um, so things things like smoking um, and heating food in plastic, um, those type of exposures can play a role as well. We're also seeing changes or increase in gut dysbiosis or gut permeability um, from things like an increased risk of C increased incidence of C-section. Um, so necessary procedure for many, life-saving life for both mom and baby it can be, um, but also when, when we're not born vaginally, we are, our gut flora is not seeded the same way. So when a baby goes through the birth canal, um, it swallows the good bacteria in the mother's vaginal tract, and that's actually the kind of it's the seed for, for the microbiome. It's kind of what gives, gives the first exposure to gut bacteria. Um, and when infants aren't exposed to that, they develop different um, bacteria because they're, they're getting it from, from a different source. Also, breastfeeding um, helps to promote uh, good bacterial growth, and there's been changes in how, how many women are breastfeeding or how many babies are breastfed. And I have a question here, so let's address this question. And the question is, though medications for age-related issues and toxins accumulate over time, does the gut age on its own? In other words, is aging alone a cause? That's a great question. Um, and there are some, some physiological changes as we age that can impact or impair our gut health. Um, one of them is we make less digestive enzymes um, in our stomach or less acid in our stomach over time, regardless of using PPIs or histamine blockers. Um, and that can decrease absorption of certain nutrients, but also can, you know, decrease the, um, decrease the barrier of preventing bad or uh, not commensal bacteria. So it's, there are some, some pieces of that that can, aging can alone be a cause. So how do we know if something's going on for you? So at, here at um, Philadelphia Integrative Medicine, we use some functional medicine testing to really look at an individual person's gut microbiome. 
Um, and this is fascinating and it's really helpful in developing a treatment plan um, that's specific to the individual. So these are three specialty tests that we use in our office. And I thought I'd just give you a brief overview of, of how what we can find out from these tests and how they can be used to um, support your microbiome. And that's a stool study, an organic acid test, and a breath test. This is an example of a stool study. Um, the companies we use for this are Genova and Doctors Data. Um, and this is more than just kind of getting an ova and parasites that we could get um, through Quest or LabCorp uh, fecal sample. This is really telling us a lot of information. Um, so this is a fecal sample that you we send you home with a kit in the office and you actually mail it into, into the company, um, the Genova or Doctors Data. And what we learn from that sample is, is there any infection? Is there any parasites? Um, it also looks at inflammation markers. Is there an increased risk for irritable bowel disease? Are certain markers elevated that would indicate that? It also looks at this fecal secretory IgA. You can see under the inflammation tab there. Um, and that is a marker for intestinal permeability. Um, so that if that is elevated, it's highly correlated with um, leaky gut or intestinal permeability. So it's one way we know if that's going on with an individual. It also looks for absorption and insufficiency. So it will let us know if you are digesting fats and proteins, which are so essential um, in terms of nutrients that our body needs, um, but it'll let us know if you're absorbing those. The last piece is imbalance. So it'll look for dysbiosis. It'll look for the ratio of good bacteria to um, potentially pathogenic bacteria. It does so by a culture. Um, so it'll do a culture for us. Um, and it also, this test in particular, which is the Genova, um, will run a DNA profile of all the bacteria in your gut. So that's pretty fascinating. Further down on the screen, you see it says diversity. So this will look at how diverse your gut bacteria is. Do you have a lot of the same? Do you have a lot of different bacteria? Um, we want to be up here. Uh, at the top here, where it's a lot of different colors and things are tight, tight together. And then it also looks at the abundance, how much bacteria do you have in your gut. So really, really fascinating study that provides a lot of individual information on what's going on with the patient's um, microbiome. And I will mention that this test is actually free for Medicare, um, and I believe it's $129 um, for insurance. Um, just to get an idea of cost for, for these types of studies. So that is a stool study. It's probably my favorite test, um, and I use this for patients that have GI complaints, but also for patients that have skin conditions, that have mood issues, um, autoimmune conditions. This is all kind of really important information to effectively treat those, those conditions. This is an organic acids test. So this is a urine test. Um, and this is a uh, nutritional test that assesses urine metabolites, and it does so in order to evaluate four critical areas of metabolism. So it looks at gastrointestinal function, so it will look at bacterial dys dysbiosis. It's also very sensitive to yeast overgrowth, so yeast can be a major problem for some people, and this is the best test to find that. It looks at cellular and mitochondrial energy production, neurotransmitter, so those are our, our um, brain chemicals processing, and amino acid and organic acid balance as influenced by vitamins and minerals. So it kind of gives us an idea of vitamin and mineral status as well. So really interesting test helps us tailor treatment um, to what's going on individually for the patient. This third test is the SIBO breath test. So the organic acid test and the stool study is really assessing the large intestines. Um, the SIBO breath test is looking at what's going on in our small intestines. And this is what we use to diagnose SIBO, that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, and this is a lactulose breath test. And this can be done at home with a kit that we would give you in the office. Um, or it actually is being done now at gastroenterologist offices because there's a large correlation between irritable bowel syndrome and positive SIBO tests. Um, so what this test does is it measures changes 
and it exhaled hydrogen and methane after drinking a sugary drink. So it's actually measuring concentrations of hydrogen and methane in your breath. The idea is that if you have an overgrowth or high levels of bacteria in your small intestines and you consume sugar, which you kind of drink a not pleasant tasting drink, um, you will have an increased production of this hydrogen and methane gas because that sugar kind of feeds the bacteria and would increase the, the production of these gases. Um, so really a fascinating test, um, you know, a definitive test for, for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth um, that can be done in a GI office or also at home with, with a kit as well. So those are the three functional medicine ways to really look at what's going on in your individual gut. And if you don't have access to these, um, that's okay. The things that I'm going to talk about next, the 4-R approach, is helpful in just promoting good gut flora and helping to rebalance all, all people's guts. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be implemented after a, a, a study. We, you can implement this before even knowing uh, individually what's going on. So this is the integrative medicine approach to restoring your gut health. And it's the 4R approach, remove, replace, re-inoculate, and repair. So we'll go through each one and kind of go why we do it and, and some practical ways to kind of implement this at home. So the first one is to remove irritants. So in order to heal the mucosal lining or to restore a good balance of good and bad bacteria, it's important to get rid of things that are irritating it or that are perpetuating inflammation there. So one of the main things that can irritate our gut is food allergies or sensitivities. Um, there are ways to kind of evaluate whether this is an issue for you. Um, one way is to try an elimination diet, which is kind of a three-week diet where you remove the most common uh, food allergies. Um, can anyone just raise their hand if they're familiar with an elimination diet? And I can provide some more information on, on that as well. That's pretty widely available now. So you remove the most common food triggers, things like gluten, dairy, soy, um, alcohol, caffeine, sugar. Yeah, it's, it's not a very fun couple weeks. Um, and then what you do is you add them back in one by one and you kind of keep a diary and you see if you have any response to them, whether it's you know increase in your bowel movements or whether you feel achy that day. Um, and it's a good way to see what what you can tolerate or if something might be bothering you. Another way to do this is to do a food allergy testing. Um, and this is looking at if your body is making antibodies to certain foods. Um, and then, you know, once we recognize that, you would eliminate them for about three months. And that's how long it takes really for your body to stop making antibodies to it. And then, and then reintroduce it and see how you do. A really simple thing to do, and it's, I think, restorative to, for most people, is to remove the most common food allergies for a period of time and to see how you do. Um, and those would be gluten and dairy. And I would recommend if you're going to remove them from your diet to do it for at least one month or 30 days. It takes that long for your body to stop making antibodies to gluten and to really see, see a difference. Um, so that would be the first thing to kind of remove that's going to be irritating to your gut. The second one would be alcohol. Um, alcohol can increase the intestinal permeability of that gut lining. Um, the third one would be medication. So this is not applicable to everyone. Um, oftentimes there's real medical need for certain uh, medications, and I would work with your you know, provider and, and what you can, and you absolutely need and what you can cannot have, but things like steroids, hormones, antibiotics, um, NSAIDs, uh, limiting those or removing those um, can be helpful in, in decreasing inflammation. The third piece would be to, or the fourth piece would be to reduce the simple sugars and carbs in our diet. They are in and of themselves inflammatory, um, so they can further perpetuate um, inflammation along that gut lining. Uh, the next one is to treat pathogens, so this is hard to do without any any known study or known pathogen going on, um, but to treat the SIBO, to treat the overgrowth or the dysbiosis um, 
if there's extra, if there's too much yeast to treat that. Um, and that is something that I would recommend working with a practitioner with um, to make sure that you're you're targeting the the pathogen, not disrupting the normal good bacteria as well. And the last one is to reduce our stress response. Um, so this is one that's easier said than done. Um, our gut is especially vulnerable to the presence of chronic stress. And when we are in this stress state and we have this high cortisol, um, we're not only decreasing blood flow to the gut and, and decreasing absorption, but we're also um, decreasing motility of the gut, so movement of food. We're decreasing um, gastric sec secretion, so the amount of enzymes or we to digest our food is decreased when we're stressed. And it can also um, increase mucosal permeability as well. All right, and so I have some questions here. Let's look at these. Okay. Um, I don't think they're questions. They're, they're more talking about the SIBO and uh, recommended diets for SIBO. Um, so uh, we work with a clinical nutritionist here to help tailor a diet for specifically small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. And it's usually a combination of a low FODMAP diet um, and SCD diet. Um, but that's something I would recommend working with a practitioner about in terms of uh, a specific diet for SIBO because that's a pretty complex issue. So this is the first step, is to remove uh, irritants. So the second R is to replace the digestive enzymes. So as, as I've kind of mentioned as we've gone along, um, as we age, we do make less digestive enzymes, particularly um, hydrochloric acid in our stomach does decrease. Um, so anything we can do to help support that is helpful. Um, Oftentimes, we'll have patients add a supplemental digestive enzyme. Um, it's something that you can find in most health food stores. You can get on our online store. And it has a combination of these enzymes that you kind of see in the picture here to help digest fats and proteins and carbs. Um, and that can be very resport, uh, supportive. And it can help actually reduce some symptoms that you might experience, things like bloating or, or abdominal pain or um, sluggishness after you eat. Um, adding a digestive enzyme can increase absorption but also help with some symptoms. Um, and that's something that you would take, you know, prior to eating most meals. Um, and most people do really well there. And I have here if indicated, um, because not everyone needs digestive enzymes. Um, that's something I can tell from, from a stool study if someone needs. But overall I said they're I would say they're relatively safe. Um, and if if you tried one, you would kind of know right away if you, if you felt some benefit there. There are other things that help um, increase digestive enzymes that you could try. Um, things like ginger tea. Ginger tea is a great uh, prokinetic, so it helps move food through your stomach. It also can help, it increases the acid in your stomach, so it helps with digestion as well. So that's a great one to, to um, sip on before meals. Foods um, that are bitter, things like greens, arugula, dandelion greens, they're bitter and they stimulate the production of more digestive enzymes. So that's something you dietary wise adding, adding to your diet could help. And another kind of tidbit would be to not drink large amounts of water with your meals. Um, I think being hydrated and drinking lots of water is important for overall wellness. Um, but if it's possible not to drink tons of water with your meals, because when you increase that fluid, it can dilute some of the stomach acid, so it can kind of decrease the, the digestive enzymes as well. So those are a couple of little practical things that can help naturally um, increase digestive enzymes. Okay. The next step is to will re-inoculate. So we want to give back or increase the amount of good bacteria in your gut. Um, and by doing so, you know, we're increasing the good bacteria, but we're also decreasing the bad bacteria. So it's kind of a, a, a too beneficial piece. Um, and there are, here are some ways to do that. One is probiotic foods, the other one is probiotic supplements, and the third one is fiber. And we'll kind of go through each one here and see. All right. So 
So probiotic foods. Um, everyone can just raise their hand if they're familiar with probiotic foods. Yeah, so it looks like most of us are, are familiar with that. Um, so probiotic and prebiotic foods work synergistically. So incorporating fresh fruits and vegetables, um, which are more of the prebiotic foods, with probiotic components really helps nourish and restore your gut health. So what are prebiotic foods? So these are the fuel for the bacteria. This is the bacteria's food. They are non-digestible carbohydrates, which help stimulate the growth and activity of good bacteria in the colon. So they, they feed the bacteria. Um, and they help keep them happy there. Some so many examples of um, prebiotic foods are dandelion greens, Jerusalem artichoke, garlic, cabbage, onion, leeks, asparagus. Um, these are all rich in prebiotics and this non-digestible carbohydrate. The other piece is you want to actually give back the good bacteria. So that would be probiotic foods. So these are foods rich in probiotics uh, that help balance and stimulate a healthy microbiome. Um, so these are foods like fermented foods. So um, things like sauerkraut and beet kvass and kimchi are all fermented vegetables that have a good source of probiotics or good bacteria. Raw apple cider vinegar has, has good bacteria in it as well. Um, organic plain yogurt is a good source of probiotics as well as kefir. Um, and then kombucha, which is actually a tea. It's quite delicious. Um, it's pretty mild. It's a little sweet. Um, and that actually has good yeast, probiotic yeast in it, um, which is helpful. And most of these things can be found at your regular grocery store these days um, or health food marks. Or you can make your own. It's actually most cost effective to make your own sauerkraut. And you can actually make your own kombucha as well. So incorporating these foods into your diet is really the recipe for success. Um, and I would recommend, you know, one to two servings a day um, would be great, a really, really great start. Some people can't tolerate dairy, so kefir and yogurt are not great options, although there are coconut and almond milk yogurt available these days that have good probiotics as well. Um, but if, you know, you're not a fan of probiotic foods or it's hard to, you know, have access to it, um, a probiotic supplement is also a good choice. And there are a lot of probiotic supplements out there, um, just like there's a lot of vitamins out there as well. Um, so I just want to give you a couple tips on how to choose and select a probiotic so that you're, you know, using your resources for the best product. Um, so I always recommend a refrigerated probiotic supplement. This helps ensure that the bacteria that's uh, supposed to be in each capsule is actually alive and well and um, ready to inhabit your gut. Um, so that, that's a good way to, to guarantee that is to buy a refrigerated product. You also want a product that has a high amount of bacteria. So something that has you know, 20 billion per capsule, which I know sounds like a lot, but bacteria are really, really small, um, is most beneficial. And then you want to flip that bottle over and you want to look at the composition of the different strains of bacteria. So the most beneficial bacteria that we know are bifido species and lactobacillus species. So having a good mix of a couple different strains of lactobacillus and bifido um, is helpful in increasing that diversity of the gut. I often, we all here at Philadelphia Integrative Medicine also recommend taking your probiotic with food. Um, that helps ensure that the bacteria gets fed and, and stays in your gut. And then oftentimes I'll have patients rotate probiotics just to help increase that diversity. You know, so take one probiotic with certain strains one month, and then when they finish that bottle, moving on to another one. Um, those would be my suggestions in terms of probiotic supplements. The third piece is fiber. So as I mentioned previously, Fiber is the food for beneficial bacteria. And our goal, which is very hard to meet, um, especially with an American diet, is actually 25 to 35 grams of fiber a day. It's a lot of fiber. Um, but what fiber does, besides feeding the good bacteria, is it helps control blood sugar. It slows down the breakdown of carbohydrates. It helps regulate your digestion, helps you go to the bathroom by 
bulking up your stool. It's important for hormone health because it helps bind hormones that are tagged for elimination through your bowel and push them out. And it plays a role in detoxification for the same purpose. So fiber also helps lower cholesterol. It's one of our most important tools to do that as well. So increasing fiber in our diet is, is great for, for overall health. Um, there is one caveat in patients that do have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. They oftentimes have trouble um, with high fiber. Um, so that's a specific population that would need some practitioner to support in how to increase their fiber. So there are two forms of fiber. Soluble fiber uh, ser serves to slow digestion and lowers blood glucose and helps balance sugar levels. This type of fiber makes you feel fuller longer, so it helps with weight loss. Um, it absorbs water and becomes gel-like when consumed. Some, some sources of this are flax seeds, lentils, peas, chia seeds, and berries are all good sources of soluble fiber. Insoluble fiber adds bulk to your stool, so this helps promote regular bowel movements and helps remove toxic waste through the colon. Some sources of these are grains, nuts, broccoli, cucumbers, carrots, green beans, zucchini. Most vegetables are pretty good sources of fiber um, as well. So when you're increasing fiber in your diet, I would urge you to go slowly because um, if you start taking a whole lot of fiber all at once, you will um, feel gassy and bloated and um, you could get constipated. Um, so you know we want to increase gradually. Um, you also want to increase your fluids as you increase your fiber um, to ensure that you don't get constipated. Um, and these are great food sources and some of the recipes that we attached in the handout are also provide some really good fiber fiber rich foods. Um, if you're having trouble incorporating them into your diet, um, adding things like ground flaxseed, which you could sprinkle over um, oatmeal or in yogurt or even in soups and salads, is a good way to add additional fiber to food. Um, you want to keep that in the fridge or freezer after it's ground because it can go rancid like other oils. And then chia seed is an excellent source as well. And you can make chia pudding or you can also sprinkle chia over, over food as well for an additional fiber benefit. And then another um, option that most people are probably familiar with is um, psyllium husk. Um, and that's a, a good fiber source too if you wanted to add a supplemental fiber on top of your food sources as well. And the last R is to repair the mucosal barrier. So these are all things that contribute to helping restore those tight junctions and reduce inflammation along that barrier in your gut. Um, so exercise does so by increasing blood flow to that area, which helps decrease uh, inflammation. Mindful eating does much of the same. It helps decrease the stress response or the cortisol level, but also to increase blood flow. Um, and this is kind of taking a second and sitting while we're eating, taking a couple of breaths prior to eating. Um, I know this is difficult to do in our busy life. Um, I'm very guilty of eating while holding a baby in one hand and kind of typing a text on the other, um, which is not helping with my digestive enzymes or my digestion by any means. Uh, but trying to be mindful when we eat um, can be really an important tool. Getting enough fluids also plays a role. And then incorporating healing foods, so fruits and vegetables as you know, organic if possible to minimize toxin exposure with pesticides and herbicides. Um, they are rich in antioxidants and they are nutrient dense, so they help provide the nutrients needs to help repair um, this lining. And then bone broth um, is a source of collagen and that helps restore the lining as well. In terms of additional antioxidants or micronutrients that could be taken as a supplement form, things that can be helpful or that we use in the clinic here are uh, vitamin D, which is often deficient in most people because of where we live in reference to the equator. Um, it's hard to absorb enough vitamin D. And it's a very important um, nutrient, acts as a hormone in our body, um, anti-inflammatory, cancer protective, heart protective, um, it also plays a big role in fatigue and, and mood and, and gut health. Um, so knowing your D level is, is important too. Um, C, E, and NAC and acetylcysteine, um, those are all antioxidants, so they help uh, decrease free radicals and inflammation. Zinc, um, the best form to take of zinc is glycinate. That's the most bioavailable. Um, zinc is often deficient. 
in a lot of people because our soil is um, nutrient deficient in zinc um, and zinc plays a key role in um, helping restore that gut lining but also in our hormone health um, with our thyroid function uh, zinc is kind of an important micronutrient omega-3 fish oil I think most of us have uh, been informed about the benefits of this um, it's very anti-inflammatory um, you want to try and use fish oil that is in triglyceride form that is the most bioavailable you also um, want to look for fish oil that has a high concentration of DHA and EPA those are the active ingredients um, so most of the clinical research with omega-3s has been about with one to three grams of EPA and DHA as anti-inflammatory properties um, L-glutamine this is an amino acid that's really essential in helping uh, restore this gut lining uh, curcumin which is probably one of our most powerful herbs um, as an anti-inflammatory. That's something that um, can be hard to digest, so having a good brand of curcumin that um, actually gets into your bloodstream and actually can have some anti-inflammatory effects is, is important. And then Gastromend uh, is a product we use. It's an herbal blend. Um, herbs like DGL or licorice root or marshmallow root, um, they're all very soothing. Uh, and help reduce inflammation in our large intestines. We also use these for reflux. Um, they can help decrease that irritation in, in the epigastric region as well. So those are all agents that help repair this mucosal barrier. So here's a summary of kind of the things we talked about today. Um, I do have some time to answer some questions. Um, it was a pleasure speaking um, to you all today. Um, I am having some difficulty looking at the questions. If Gail, if you could please read them to me, that would be really helpful. Um, and I will try. Ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay, so the first one is caffeine and irritant. It can be. Um, it can be more an irritant I see towards the um, epigastric region, so that area of where your esophagus and your um, stomach meet with reflux, that's when I see the most of the irritation with, with caffeine um, as opposed to the large intestines. Thank you. Now the next question is, how does an anti-inflammatory medication increase inflammation? So it increases inflammation in the gut. Um, it, it increases over it decreases generalized inflammation by inhibiting COX-2 um, but in the gut it can be very irritating because it can cause that tight junctions to come apart um, and when that happens it causes a cytokine response so um, it can be counterintuitive in that sense. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, next question is what about taking a standard multivitamin? Sure. Um, so multivitamins can be can be great depending on what might a multivitamin you're taking. Um, they often don't have um, enough of the nutrients that I'm referring to that help repair the gut lining to have um, the best impact. Um, but it all depends on kind of the quality of the multivitamin as well. Is there a particular one that you recommend or? Um, um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of good ones out there. Um, there are certain things that I look for on a multivitamin that kind of clue me in on whether it's high quality. Um, the first one is to look at the vitamin B12. Um, if it says cyanocobalamin next to the B12, um, it's likely not uh, the best brand. Um, cyanocobalamin is the inactive form of B12. It's also made from cyanide. Um, so you want to look for something that has um, methylcobalamin, adenosylcobalamin, or hydroxycobalamin. Those are the active forms of B12. So that's just kind of a quick thing to look at on a multivitamin to see if, if, you're, if you're getting the right forms of, of B vitamins. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody had a question about whether these slides will be available after the event. And sure. But they will be okay. Yeah. So you can just email if they're interested. Sure. Okay. Just email sure. me at um, G to Marchio, T is in Tom, O M A R C H I O at flcpartners.org and I will send them to you. Okay. And then somebody had a question about um, why do you recommend testing before taking action steps? 
I would love to have testing before taking action steps, um, but I realize that these, these tests aren't available to everyone. Um, and these four R approaches are, are safe um, and they're, they're helpful and they're for even patients that aren't having complaints. Um, they're kind of just good gut health practices. So while it'd be great to get, to get the testing, it's not, you know, 100% necessary. Oh, okay. Thank you. So it's like that would be the, the gold standard to do the testing first. Absolutely, test. yeah. Yeah, because then you can really tailor, tailor treatment plan to the, to the individual. Um, and it's also, I find, um, easier for patients to follow a plan when they can see kind of in writing, this is what's going on in my gut. You know, it's very, it's a lot easier to eat that kimchi and to, um, uh -huh. and to sit down and, and, and do breathing before your meals when you kind of see exactly what's going on with you. Absolutely, when you understand the, the cause and the effects. Um, right. So I had a request to repeat the email address. So again, that is G as in um, girl, Tamara Chia, that's T as in Tom, O, M as in Mary, A, R, C, H, I, O, at flcpartners.org. Again, Tamarchio is like two March I O, the, the last name. Um, so the last question I have up here is: Do you do you retest your patients after implementing the four R's to measure improvement? I often do. I often do because I think it's one rewarding for the patient to see like, oh look, all this hard work, and look how how much better my my gut bacteria look. Um, so yes, I, I do often repeat it. Well, that makes perfect sense to kind of see the before yeah. and after, right? Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much. That's our last question. And I would yeah. really appreciate your presentation today, Norm. That was really informative and, and gave us a lot of uh, root causes of a lot of problems that we may be experiencing. Um, yeah. And I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to attend today's webinar. Um, and once you leave, you're going to receive a survey. And we'd really appreciate it if you would provide your feedback so we can continue to improve in the future as we bring more wellness webinars your way. Um, you will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. So you can uh, view the webinar again or share it with others. Uh, and thank you very much. And don't forget the, um, the handout of the summary of the presentation is available on your uh, handout screen as well as a few recipes. Um, and thank you all and have a wonderful rest of the day.